Hey, there we are. It's me, John Park, and now I've hit the right button, and look, I've got a Scott Shawcroft right there. Hello. That's Tan Newt. Let me stop my echo. Uh, and hopefully you can hear him. I'm going to crank this mic up. Can you hear me? Can you hear that guy? C. Grover, can you hear me? Yeah, we've got uh, some <laughs> Confederates in the audience who help us figure out our audio levels. So right. I'm going to pop open my chat window so I can keep an eye on that. Loud and clear. Yeah, Wild Perfect. Scott has appeared. Uh, can you believe it? So, uh, what's going on here? Well, I'll tell you what. Yes, Scott is loose in my lab, and it is uh -huh. a very special edition of John Park's workshop because it's Supercon. The Hackaday Superconference is happening this week here in sunny Southern California. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, dragged a Scott out of his natural environ, <laughs> where it's cloudier, I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. Older, uh, to, Currently, uh, to at least. So, um... I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through some of our usual stuff, and then Scott and I are going to have a chat. Uh, if you have questions for Scott, circuit Python-y things, Bluetooth-y things, drone things, all sorts of yeah. Scott like interests, let Any us know Any sorts in the chat. of things. Uh, did you know that we're on Discord? Uh, we are. We're, we're on Discord. That's where you can find the chat, or YouTube. And I'm sorry if you're over in Facebook land, we don't have enough eyeballs to keep an eye on every place or Twitch, but come on over to the Adafruit Discord and uh, mm -hmm. we'll chat with you. URL is adafru.it slash Discord. Yeah, yeah, it is. Excellent. Uh, and we'll turn on that iPad and, and be able to check the chat when we're over on that side. So, uh, first I'm going to get to uh, some of our usual stuff. And Scott, you're welcome to sit there and hang out and hack things. Someone yeah. asked if you could install CircuitPython in this wood box. Um, um, I don't think there's enough RAM. Okay, it won't work. In the, in the wood done. box. It's impossible. Uh, and uh, good, okay, we're getting a VU meter from, uh, from our friend C. Grover. So I'm going to see if I can do that. Okay. Testing. Uh, hey, hell, guess what? My microphone broke last week. That's what that hum was about. I know some of you have been like freaking out the whole week wondering, will that ever be solved? Will that mystery be solved? Well, yeah. Uh, the cable became a little bit uh, weak where it connects to the mic. So uh, there you go. I have that one. I, I sort of fixed it up with some Subaru. It may still work, but I have it on backup because I got a new mic because, you know, it's important that you hear us. Uh, all right. So let's see what's going to happen next. Well, I'll tell you what. Did you know that we have a job board? That's what that help wanted sign stands for right there. Uh, and in fact, I'm gonna pop over to that uh, and give you a little view into the jobs board. Hey, let's, uh, I'm just gonna move sideways. Oh, look, Scott's still there. Uh, check it out, <laughs> we've got a uh, jobs board. It's free, it's free if you're looking to hire someone. It's also free if you're looking for work. So today I'm on the available for hire page and there you can see some uh, great experienced looking people doing all sorts of different uh, offering skills for web development, engineering, 3D and CAD, uh, education and teaching, programming teacher, all kinds of good stuff. So um, please, won't you check it out? Uh, oh, whoa, in our <laughs> chat right now, um, my mind is blown. Uh, Toddbot just uh, showed a behind the scenes and it's getting fractal around here. Uh, so I wish I could throw that on my live stream. So, uh, Check out the jobs board because that's where you may find your next job. Yeah, believe it or not, I posted on there. Did you? Yeah. So what's I the, did. What's the story? How'd you end up? Uh, how'd you end up here with us? I'm gonna I'm gonna point a camera at you. Uh oh, not that one. Different one. So I uh, 
was going on show and tell a lot doing my drone stuff and uh, teaching all about that and the PCBs I made and did a factory tour at Macrofab on show and tell. And um, once I started selling stuff, it didn't sell that well. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to find a job that actually will pay me. And so I posted on the jobs board um, on Adafruit there and actually didn't hear anything. Um, this is like three plus years ago. So it was a very different jobs board. Uh, but then I went on show and tell and I said, Hey, like I'm looking for a job. Oh, that's <laughs> and, and, this... the, and the next day I got an email from Phil saying like, Hey, we have a project. Are you interested? So. Not only is that a great story, but I think it's probably what prompted us to revisit how our jobs board works. So we won't miss the next Scott Shawcroft next time. It was on we'll our see. forums. Is that where it was? Or was it his own little weird? It was its thing? own weird thing. Right, I don't mean to disparage it. It had, it, it had security problems. That's oh. why they redid it. <laughs> oh, internet. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what else have we got for you. Oh, check this out. I have a little uh, little thing coming up. So if you if you take a gander here, uh, you will see that we have an Ada box coming out in 17 days, uh, roughly. That's when we'll be shipping it. I know we have some very specific Don't minutes these and minutes. seconds on there, but uh, it should be coming out uh, roughly 17 days from now. Uh, and and look at this. Look at this happy. Ada box. So the Ada box 14 can be yours if you subscribe today. Uh, look at these happy people. Look at the happiness there. Exchanging gifts. That's right. It's Ada box 14 holiday edition. We have snowflakes. There are snowflakes involved. Uh, so go to Ada box. You can uh, you can go to adafruit.com slash Ada box and uh, check out how to subscribe, or you can sign someone up for a subscription. So uh, you've been warned. It's coming soon, Box 14. All right. Uh, now, let's see. You know what I'd love to, uh, to mention is that we have a coupon code, and the coupon code for today <laughs> will get you 10% off in the store. And the coupon code, as you may have guessed, is SCHWAFORT. That's right. It is... Schwa fort. And uh, so I say uh because that is the schwa sound. Uh, uh, schwa. Look up pronunciation videos on YouTube sometimes. It's really weird. People say words and then they just repeat like one of the vowels a bunch. It's kind of upsetting and bizarre. Uh, but schwa fort, not only is it a great coupon code, but it is also an anagram for our guest today, Scott Shawcroft. That's right, Shawcroft is actually. Uh, a cryptographically hidden reference to the ancient schwa fort of the Seattle, Washington peoples. It's true. Why is Todd laughing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can tell it's going to be a nice I don't. Show. I don't think he believes yes. you. That's he why. Me? <laughs> All right, do the math. Schwa fort. It's um, all the same letters. <laughs> Ten percent off in the store, so you can uh, pick up some cool stuff other than software gift certificates or subscriptions. But all the physical, real things, yes, ten percent off. Uh, speaking of real physical things, I have a product pick of the week. And my product pick of the week is this delicious little keypad. This is the 4x4 matrix keypad. And the reason is we actually have another hidden theme for today. We've got snow globes, yes. We've got Shawcroft, uh-huh. But we also have phone freaking and dual tone multifunction dialing. Uh, and you may recognize a lot of this pad as a, uh, a, a dial pad from a telephone. And uh, then you're wondering about these A, B, C, and D characters. That's actually part of the specification for uh, what became known as touchtone dialing, uh, which is a set of columns and rows that are actually four by four, except they left these A, B, C, D off of most civilian phones and were only used inside of the military systems and later the Audubon system. So uh, some extra frequencies there. And so if you want to uh, get your phone freak on and build a little project using this matrix keypad, it only uses eight pins. It can plug into any of our microcontrollers and there's some code examples for getting that to do neat stuff. And I have a project in mind coming up using this. So. Pretty cool for data entry in general. And that's the product pick of the week is the 4x4 matrix keypad. Um, someone figured out how to type the schwa character in the Discord, Andy Calloway. That was thoughtful of him, I thought. Thanks, man. Uh, all right, well, you know what? This brings us to a little thing that I like to call the Make Code Minute. All right, so 
let's uh, bring in, whoa, that's a lot of us. Can you see that? <laughs> you have a twin. There's so many of me. Oh, you've disappeared. Uh, yeah. I'm going to bring up my Chrome browser, and I'm going to bring up a uh, camera <laughs> so that I can show you. Where's my uh, Chrome browser? There you are. So I can show you the Make Code Minute. Uh, let's get this. No, I'm going to take that out of the way because there's a lot of code here. Okay, so for the Make Code Minute today, what I wanted to do is show you how you can dial a phone using the Circuit Playground Express with a Stemma speaker plugged into it and some fairly straightforward Make Code code. Uh, the key to it actually is what I have on screen right here right now, which is two forever loops. So Make Code is threaded. We can do two things at the same time which is perfect for dual tone multifunction dialing because it is a set of two frequencies being played together to represent each key. And the phone system uh, sort of filters that and can tell which unique uh, digit you're pressing on the keypad as well as the asterisk and the pound. So what is going on here is that I have created an array of those frequencies. So you can see here I have 941 and 1336. And then you'll see somewhere else I have 941 and 1209. So these are the columns and rows of frequencies. So I can dial anything on the keypad. Uh, and then I have a phone number that I'm calling here. So I've entered in the phone number for the Naval Observatory clock. When I uh, hit go, I'm going to press, press the A button. It's going to allow the number to dial. Uh, it's going to show some status on some NeoPixels. And then it's going to do this play tone. Let me zoom in there. It's going to do this play tone at keypad, get value, current number. Uh, so this is running through the either first or second digit in those arrays uh, to play the tones. So let's uh, bring that up on the overhead camera. In fact, let's go to the, the down shooter here. Um, I'm going to turn up the volume. I have a switch for that. And let's listen to this once. Okay, so that's the number being dialed. And now a dangerous live demo. I'm going to try to call that with the microphone and this phone. So you can hear, there's my dial tone. And now I'm going to play it. It sounds like it made a call. Oh, I got a wrong number. Contact customer care for assistance. I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> okay, that was not the number, so something was off. So I found this a little finicky as far as the distance from the speaker or what the speaker is sitting on, and I won't uh, subject you to trying now, but I've had pretty good success rate, especially in certain places and setting on a mouse pad, uh, where I can reliably call a phone number right off of this little speaker on the Circuit Playground Express. And that is your Make Code Minute. Okay, so that brings us to uh, this little number, which is our Make Code Arcade Game of the Week. Uh, so let me pop my Chrome browser back up, and I'm going to go over here. So this is one I found in the Microsoft Forum. So head to forum.makecode.com if you want to uh, take a look at the latest things that are happening in the Make Code world. It's a great resource, people discussing issues and uh, announcing things, as well as showing off their work. Uh, and so this is a really... Uh, fantastic platformer uh, created by Dragon Mountain Design. It's called Turtle Monkey Trouble. Uh, and one thing that I love about it is that he designed and 3D printed his main character for this game. So that is Turtle Monkey. And Turtle Monkey is trouble. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at uh, the game itself. Here it is. Uh, let me get my keys straight. So, oh no, your friends have been captured and are locked up somewhere in the jungle. You've got to rescue them. But watch out for enemies and traps. Jump on the top to defeat them. Also, fire is very bad. Yes. All right, look at this. Look at this little turtle monkey. He's a monkey, he's a turtle. He's a monkey, he's a turtle. Monkey, turtle. And I can jump on this crab's head. Ha, take that crab. So I'm so impressed. Can you believe the quality of these games that we can create? Oh, don't die. Uh, using Make Code Arcade. And I'm sure this is a really fun one to play on a handheld as well. Now, uh, Dragon Mountain Design said this is a beta. So uh, there are probably still some unfinished bits to it. Uh, and I'm not going to go into uh, how the game works, but I'll say two things. One, if we zoom out here, we can see the number of blocks. It's big, but it's not terrifying. And this is a pretty gettable game. So it might be a good example game to look at. And also Dragon Mountain Design mentioned that 
he uh, learned a lot about making this type of 2D platformer from the Make Code Arcade or the Make Code team's YouTube channel. They have a tutorial series on making 2D platformers. So I recommend you go check that out if you like the looks of this kind of game or if you like the looks of Turtle Monkey Trouble, which is my game of the week pick. How about that? How about that, Scott? What do you think of that? Scott and Todd have disappeared. Cool. <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. I was looking at the code. I was like, oh, oh that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, you might want to look at the Java code, uh, JavaScript code, too. Oh, it. yeah. It's another view into the world. Right, um, right. And, in fact, let's take a side conversation here because Scott and I were talking about this <laughs> earlier. Um, you were asking me about what I find appealing about make code. Right. Um, and you come from a sort of linear text coding mm -hmm. background, and I kind of yep. have a split background with some scripting as well as a lot of visual connection. Right. And right. what I found is that particularly the logic on figuring out how I want to do something, I love the representation that's visual. Mm -hmm. um, but then for certain tasks, I don't want to sift through for copying and pasting or you know right. repetitive things or searching and replacing. I like that. So I'm kind of curious if you feel there's a place in the world for something in the middle there. Oh, yeah, definitely. I I think some folks have heard this already, but I, I am very, very, very interested in how do you edit code from a phone or a tablet, like with a touch screen. And I don't think that the model that we have where I come from, where it's like one big text file and you have a cursor and your keyboard and a mouse and stuff, that doesn't work on a touch screen. And so I, I've come to kind of believe that there's a middle ground between very block heavy stuff, which works well on a touch screen and text stuff where uh, you can get to a point where you can do anything you want in a programming language with it, uh, but you interact with it like you would blocks mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like very much a middle ground, I yeah. think. No, I find that interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. There's something about the navigation and, and the space of where I want to put things physically to even just think about them separately. Like, here's a function, and I'm just going to set yeah. it up at the top, and I think of it as a, as a physical yeah. space thing. That response made it trickier for me because <laughs> I definitely, like, I, like we, we talked about this a little bit, too. Like, like computers are very linear. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the Make Code folks have done a great job under the hood to make it not mm -hmm. linear to you. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it, at the end of the day, they are. Yep. And so I, I had never thought about how do I break that for a tablet mm -hmm. or anything. And, mm -hmm. and so I think I'm not sure how I would take that in, but yeah. it's definitely worth thinking about yep. um, yeah, and even think based on that feedback. Even if you're keeping things somewhat linear, there's something about moving in a different depth to be able to go beyond cold code folding, but to do things like I can yeah. suck things down into what looks to me like one object and then dive into it to, right. to right. deal right. with its guts if I want right. to and then pop back out. That right. Helps you still know where you came yeah. from. Yeah. 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 For sure. Interesting. All right. Yeah. Um, be interested to hear people chime in on the on the chat. We'll be on Discord uh, later also to, to chat with people and, and these guys might be checking it out now but uh, yeah, what do you we think were. about that? What do you think about yeah, uh, food for thought? Yeah, the visual representation of your code. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about how much bigger my head is than Scott is? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, so, I'm back here because the mic is back here. Yes, that's for right. For anybody who's here. wondering why we're doing this. <laughs> we, have, we have a couple mics going and that made it easier. Yeah. Um, but you know what? I'm headed over there because I want to talk about our project this week. So let me go uh, to just the main cam and the bench cam, and maybe I'll switch those if necessary. Yeah, so that box is there so we can see our project a little better. So Still not running CircuitPython, though. God damn it. Uh, we should put a Blinkist sticker in the bottom. That's about as close as we can get. Uh, so what I've got here, and uh, someone let me know in the chat if you're getting a double mic thing since I'm near this one. In fact, I'll just point it away since I'm wearing the lav. Let me know if I need to mute one. Um, so this is here so that we can see this, and I'm going to show it first because I think that's the best way to understand this project, which is interactive snow globes. So I'm just prepping this one, and then we'll take a look at how it works. All right, so I'm using the box to make things darker so you can see this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little uh, DIY snow globe I made and give it a shake and set it down there where we can see it. Uh, and so that is a Blue Fruit Circuit Playground Express, which means if I go to my phone, in fact, I'm going to switch the 
camera to the big one for you. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, yeah, that's cool, huh? <laughs> that's a Circuit Python thing changing my nice. camera views. Uh, so there's my Sonoglobe, Globe, and right now it's running a um, bit of code that Carter wrote, which allows us to pick different patterns using the uh, Bluefruit app on the phone. So I'm going to connect, and you can see right there when I connected, it flashed blue. And then when I head to the controller page, I can go to the color picker and try out different colors and different uh, brightness values. So I like that blue. That looks cool. Yeah, it looks good. So now I'm going to head back to the control pad section. Uh, and from here, I have a few different options. I can pick different patterns. So that is a clockwise sweep. And there's a counterclockwise sleep, sweep. And here is, when it finishes, did I hit it twice? Some strobe effect. <laughs> and this is a sort of random sparkle. What the arrow keys allow us to do is change the speed of the animation as well as the duration of it. So I'm going to set it short. So using the left arrow, it's going to make it shorter. And what Carter and I talked about was making this very interactive. So when you hit something, you're always going to see a change. So you know uh, you're not just. Uh, how many milliseconds less is this? I don't know. And then you have to try it out. It always happens immediately, mm -hmm. uh, even though the normal state of it is accelerometer driven. So normally you'll set this and then you can pick it up and shake it. So we'll get there. Uh, and let me, let me speed it up. Let me make this even faster. And I'll go back to the strobe because that one's crazy. <laughs> uh, so now I can leave it in this state and give that a shake. Oh, did I break it? I saw a green light in there. What have I done? <laughs> All right, live demo. Is it just, or is it too short? No, I think I need to reset it. Oh, I know what happened. Carter is, if you're watching, is screaming at me. The accelerometer doesn't work while we're connected via Bluetooth. So. Oh, really? Yeah, we've got it. Uh, 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 where it uh, only, uh. yeah, it only does that. All right, let's let's go back, and I'm gonna eat my own dog food and, and reset this. So, uh, let's go to controller, color picker blue, and I'll just leave it at the current duration, and I'll pick a different animation. Okay. So now what I'll do is disconnect from Bluetooth, and I can't remember what the reasoning was, so you might... Well, it makes sense if you're, like, using the Bluetooth to change the animation and stuff. You don't want to, like, mix the two. Right. Yeah, you're right. You'd clash uh, yeah. with them. Okay. So now that, now that the thing is disconnected, you can give it a shake and get your... Blinky, blinky effect. Nice. Uh, so that is um, the main demo I wanted to do of what we're doing with the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. And the other aspect of this is just the uh, creative crafting aspect of building these. So we sell these uh, sort of DIY um, snow globe kits. And what you'll see is that they have a lid, but I have not plunged my Circuit Playground Express and LiPo battery into water, because that's a bad idea. Um, but instead, it has a little stopper that goes in, and the way these normally work, the pressure of the lid being screwed on uh, forces the stopper in to prevent a leak, but I don't trust that enough, and so I use some very good glue, E6000 glue, uh, and let it set up overnight. And so this stopper is now in there for good, and, and it's not going to leak out of there. Um, and then. Part of the fun is what are you going to put in there? I've got uh, some fake snow flakes. They seem to work pretty well, but they, they want to float. So they'll go up to the top. But the neat thing is sometimes they glom onto other objects and lift them. I've got uh, some sequins in there. So you'll see some little snowflake mm -hmm. sequins, although I bet you can't really see that up here. Trust me, person. you can't. <laughs> Trust God. Uh, <laughs> and then I've got some glitter. Uh, so you'll find, you know, there's these like silver glitter. Here's these cool sequins here, and these sort of float around a little bit and, and move on their own. So those are fun. Uh, the other thing you can do, which is also really interesting, is make little dioramas. So here I found just a little, a uh, couple of figures at the craft store and glued them down as well as some scenery. So you can buy these uh, little trees for, for doing scenery if you build sets or uh, model railroading stuff. And you got to be careful to make sure it'll still fit in there. But what we can do is add some water, and I won't fill it all the way up because we're going to displace some of that with, with the characters. Let's see how that does. Maybe a little more. 
Uh, and then just to be bizarre, I've got sea creatures. So this is going to be your typical Arctic woodland creatures and sea creatures living in harmony. So we have a hermit crab, a manatee, a little squid looking guy, and a penguin. Uh, oh, and an octopus. So they're going in there. And uh, what's, what should we use uh, for, for, for glitter? You, do you think any? Mm. We've got these. We've got uh, some sequins over here. I like the, these ones. So, oh yeah, so these are like little hexagon gold ones. All right, let's see. Can you open that up? Yep. It might, you might unscrew the lid because I think sometimes there's a cardboard. Uh, there we go. All right, so we'll add a little glitter. And I actually treat this glitter like I would a hazardous <laughs> material because you just don't want to get it all over your workshop. You definitely have some on your bench already. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, all right, so let's see what our displacement looks like. We could use some more water than that. So I'm going to try to sneak the water in. Yeah. I can, I, oh. You have more hands today. I know. I, I'm so used to <laughs> not. I don't know what to do with all this help. Thank you. All right. I'm just imagining you let it go and the ball just goes Patish. All right, that's not bad. I would, I would normally try to get that filled up more. Uh, so I'm not going to glue that down now, but let's take a look at what we get. Uh, yeah, you can see that on that camera. In fact, can I zoom that camera in? That might be a better view of the world. Let's try. Wow. Yeah. So, oh, look at that little hermit crab. He's just, he's just saying hi to the owl. And they're all swimming around in <laughs> harmony. All right. So it really does magnify them a lot. Yeah, too, things doesn't it? things get create is really cool. Really magnified a lot. In fact, I was goofing around with this idea. I found one of these at the craft store, which is a DIY put your photo in their globe, and so it's got a little uh, sort of dry bay in there, hmm. and this. Uh, I, I won't be able to push that all the way in, but you'll see you get like a really hugely magnified. In fact, let's pull this battery off. You get a really hugely magnified. Can you pull that battery off of there, that foam? Gigantor Circuit Playground Express. You ready for this? <laughs> Funk. Look at that versus nice. that little itty bitty one. So oh, it's pretty wow. good magnification. All right. So, um, so that is my contribution to weirdness for the holiday season, and it's subtle. <laughs> the penguins upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it's subtle. Uh, but with the addition of some lighting, he put that back on there. Let's see how that illuminates them. And I, I resisted the temptation of putting in like a little beach uh, sand or something under there because then we won't see the light glow through. But hopefully, okay, yeah, hopefully we'll get some lighting effects. Remember, this is the dangerous one that's not glued down. So we're gonna I was like, tight. Can I flip that right. one too? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That looks good. Ah, that's pretty convincing. Uh, and so you could find all kinds of different creatures, Lego figures, um, pet rocks. There's a lot of stuff that you can. There we go. That looks good. <laughs> that you can put in there. Um, so that is the project of the week. I'll be writing up a guide on this. I'll be giving you some tips. Uh, one of the ones I didn't do it actually on that one, uh, and it's okay. But this other one that's really all about the the objects moving in there. I've added a little bit of glycerin, um, which mm. helps to uh, sort of give an extra bit of viscosity to the liquid, and so you get some floatier bits in there, which is fun. <laughs> um, so that is that. Now what I'm going to do is move some of this stuff out of the way so that Scott and I can talk about something he's been hacking on. So, so this is a specific pretty cool thing. So let me... Uh, Maybe, Scott, you can start talking about it while I clear this. All right, are we talking Game Boys? We're talking Game Boys, yeah. All right, so uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, one of my tropes is that I like to put CircuitPython on everything. Um, unfortunately, the wood box just doesn't have enough RAM to be able to put CircuitPython in it, although I like the uh, Blinka sticker idea. Um, but one thing I wanted to make uh, accessible, so CircuitPython is great because it makes it easy to program whatever. So it's, you plug it in, it shows up as a drive, you have code, you edit the code, and it auto restarts super quick. Um, and I wanted to bring this to existing electronics. And one of the pinnacles of retro 
uh, electronics, at least for me as a kid of the uh, early 90s or late 80s, is the Game Boy. So I wanted to make it easy to um, program with CircuitPython Game Boys. So what I did is I made a cart, and the cart runs CircuitPython. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, the same chip that you would get on a Feather M4 or a Metro M4, I put it on a, a Game Boy cartridge. Do you have one of those you can show? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think I, I think it's in the, it's in the Game Boy. So here's a Game Boy, and we have this. Glitter everywhere. <laughs> so, all right, there we're in the middle. So this is a Game Boy that Phil Lamore actually got me, um, and it's green, which is awesome. Um, this is these large ones are oh too far. Um, they're called the DMG because the model number. This sticker is gone, but the model number was DMG, and it stands for Dot Matrix Grid. The way that the display works is that it's a uh, LCD screen, and it's in a grid of just dots, um, hence the name. Um, so what I did is I, I decided to make a cart of my own. So this cartridge here is an Oshpark PCB that I've designed. It is not Aladdin. <laughs> I used <laughs> the uh, Game Boy cart here as a donor uh, piece of plastic to just make sure that the offset uh, into it was all OK. Um, and if we want to see it, we could actually open the cartridge up, too. If you want to. Which one do you want to open? This. We need, oh, yeah. We need the game bit okay. thing here. I need my glasses to see the right bit. I got you. you. Find it? I Yay. got you. Ah, youth. I know. Right? <laughs> I, have good, I have good eyes still, which is nice. Oh, this is the big one. So if you don't know, there are a couple proprietary screws that Nintendo yeah, used so on stuff. Yeah, so... Yep. That, that might focus. Yeah, so there's just one screw there, and it's like this weird six-sided screw thing. Um, these iFixit kits usually have them, so it, it's really great. Great to use those. Um, that just lets us pop open the cart here. So you slide it one direction, and then you can pop the top off. So there is the... So that's a M0 chip? It's an M4. M4 chip. It's a SAMD51. Okay. Yep. And what it basically does is it gives us 100... We, we have 120, me 120 megahertz to decide what the Game Boy should do for us. Um, so the way that it speaks to the Game Boy is through the cartridge connected here. So all of these are little wires that talk to the Game Boy. And the Game Boy is saying, like the CPU of the Game Boy is always saying, hey, uh, what should I be doing next, right? It's, fe it's fetching instructions that the Game Boy CPU should run. So what CircuitPython does in here is it allows you to just say, hey, tell the Game Boy this set of things, and then that allows you to do kind of whatever you want um, on the Game Boy itself. So uh, we have a couple demos set up today. Uh, we can see what this one's doing. I don't actually know. Um, it might be running Celeste, so... Um, Celeste is a really awesome uh, game on Nintendo Switch that you should play if you haven't. Uh, this one is uh, the original prototype that they did. Um, and let's see. So, Moment of truth, what's on the Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. So all of the carts will start by dropping down the word Adafruit. And you actually did the, the, the pixel, art for, it, pixel yeah. art for it. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, it's fun to see that. And now what it's going to do is it's going to load all of the assets, so all of the different characters. John's talked a lot about sprite sheets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what it's doing is the Game Boy has a custom area in its memory that holds a sprite sheet. So what it's doing now is it's loading it off the CircuitPython drive and putting it into memory of the Game Boy. Um, and then if we hit a button, that's the splash screen. And now we're actually playing. You can probably see it decently well. So these screens are kind of terrible. Mm -hmm. um, they're notorious. So they're not backlit. And there's a contrast wheel here. So you can see that it actually adjusts yeah, it helps. Uh, depending on what you're doing. So you can actually play. But the demo is actually way better. Yeah, so I've got, do you want me to, oh, you want to show it on color? Yeah. Uh, excellent. Do you want this cartridge? 
Yeah, so these are the, this is the monochrome one, and then uh, there's a Game Boy Pocket that was small, but same screen-ish. Here's the pocket. And then there's this Game Boy Color. This is the pocket. There's a pocket. And the Game Boy Color is also a, ref, uh, I guess, a reflective screen. It doesn't have backlighting, but it is in color. Right. So we have another, this is the same cartridge, basically same code, and we'll just flip it on. And you see it doesn't drop down Adafruit, but it does show up below there. And then again, it's going to load all of the different sprite sheets into the memory. If it is doing what I think it's doing, which it totally could not be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can actually also just take this cart. I think it is. I, I did it earlier. And so the interesting thing is that uh, just as we've gotten used to with CircuitPython uh, on, on the various Adafruit boards is that Scott just plugs this into his computer via USB and yep. is editing a text file, a .py. File. Right, so there's a USB plug right here next to these two MIDI plugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, MIDI plugs, you said. I right, know. So in fact, let's show this one. This is this is one that I modified. Oh, there we go. Like yeah, so color. that's the... I modified this is also a DMG uh, Game Boy, but I modified it to have a backlit screen. Um, adjust there. So you can see these a lot better. Right. Uh, and I also modified it to have a line out for the audio. It's uh, separate of the little headphone amp, and that sounds better when you're going through an amplifier. Oh, you know what? Guitar I turned, amp. I did turn this down. Yeah. So we'll turn that up. And so talk about why you have a MIDI cart, uh, MIDI ports on there, and what that's actually doing with the hardware. Right. So I know I know that people really like making music with Game Boys because there's a sense of nostalgia. Um, like if we just turn it off and back on again, it'll go kaping, and people will just be like super excited about it. So I did the first few revisions without it, and then I was like, oh, people are going to want this. Um, so what it's doing is it uh, just acts as a UART. So it's UART MIDI, as you normally would with CircuitPython. It's got the like level shifting and opto isolation in here. And for people who aren't um, familiar, even though we talk about MIDI a lot, MIDI is the musical instrument digital inner face or interchange or something like that, but it's a, it's a way that, uh, starting in the mid-80s, that uh, synthesizer manufacturers made uh, interoperability between devices. So we use it right. essentially to send note data and uh, control changes, which are sort of knob turns, to, right. the, to anything, but in this case to the cartridge, which has software running on it, that then takes that incoming note data, for example, and does what? Right, so it's, it's CircuitPython code that's reading in the incoming stuff the Adafruit MIDI library that folks have really helped us make awesome uh, is doing all of the parsing and figuring out what it is. And then when we see Note On, we actually queue up to the Game Boy and say, like, hey, like you have the sound hardware, play this note for us. All right, let's do it. So I've got uh, a little sequencer here, kind of a more modern device, uh, <laughs> that can send out these MIDI notes. Let's zoom out a little bit more. This is more about hearing it than seeing it, actually. Yeah. And uh, we can do a couple interesting things. So we can play uh, notes in sequences to this. We can also adjust some of these parameters. So let's just try playing some uh, a little sequence of notes. So, so there you've got uh, some notes being sent out. Super musical. Um, <laughs> well, it's doing some of the sweep register. That's yeah, partly so there's a why it sounds weird. Going on, right? So, so the pitch is kind of warbling a little. Uh, and and the reason is earlier today when Scott came over here, like we four could just hours reset ago, the Game Boy and it would. Oh, uh, that's okay. Um, we got. Uh, to talking about some of the other things that we can access. Mm -hmm. And so, so we decided, you know, what if we could change the pulse width modulation of the square waves? Or what if we could send info to sweep up and down these sort of note scales, uh, arpeggios? Mm -hmm. So uh, these will send these control changes to the software, these knobs, uh, mm -hmm. when we're over in this mode. And we can play an individual note. How about, so we'll stop. Yes! <laughs> so great. I don't know, that's so sad. What if we do this? Huh? Ooh! 
<laughs> so that's just going either direction. So in this mode, I'm just sending a few different uh, notes, like on a piano keyboard, but then we can adjust these to change the way the sound sounds. So right. this should adjust our pulse width modulation, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of a different character to the harmonics of that. And I can lower, can I lower the volume? I'm not sure if I can, or the notes. Yeah. So now I'm sending a different MIDI note, a lower MIDI note uh, to right. the device. Right, and all the frequency changes are dictated by the Game Boy. Yeah. We've told the Game Boy, like, hey, change the frequency over time. So this is super excellent, and uh, I think part of the excitement about this is that it's pretty compelling to get two or three of these and send mm -hmm. MIDI chords and do a little orchestra, right, right. which typically programming uh, Game Boy to do music stuff, uh, there, there, there's some software like, uh, what's the one? Little Sound DJ? Little Sound DJ, LSDJ. Yeah. Uh, it's a tracker. It is cool, but it's also a different mode of, of entering things using right. the Game Boy itself. This will allow you to use any digital audio workstation software mm -hmm. like Ableton Live uh, or dedicated sequencer yeah. types of devices or right. keyboards you may have seen. And there, there are options already to get MIDI into a Game Boy as well, but yeah. this is by far the, I think, cheapest and easiest. And it's quite hackable because I think you're oh, going yeah. to get these libraries into a state where uh, someone who's not much of a programmer like me can go in right. and noodle around with the, the Python code, hopefully, right, so yeah, that yeah. I can adjust the behavior of this so that Every time I press one MIDI note, I get a chord. That mm -hmm. kind of stuff is, is mm -hmm. possible once you're in a scripting. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Totally. That is awesome. Uh, so let us know in the comments if you have other questions or things you, you're, you're wondering about how this works. But I think that demonstrates really, really nicely. Um, yeah, it's just so fun. That's the best right there. That's, <laughs> that's better than playing it. Let's, let's play it again. Uh, yeah, we were doing this earlier. We could totally just get sucked going. into it. Uh, the other thing is interesting is that there are actually four voices, four different mm -hmm. waveforms that can play simultaneously in the Game Boy hardware, which right. means that we could, uh, when, when we say send Here, like chords, we could send multiple notes at once that are playing in these four uh, different registers or, or uh, sounds. Right, voices. Voices, yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> so what we d I just turned it off and back on again, and that's going to reset the state of the sound hardware. So you can see it now sounds very classic, like, pitch stuff. So I'm setting the notes right now. Yeah, very much more, like... Game Boy Music style. It's like we're getting into like a little Mario is a detective kind of uh, yeah. hidden N64 level that no one's ever found before. <laughs> I feel that. I dig that. So two's not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's on the second voice, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Whew, so thanks, fun. thanks for uh, for letting us show that off. I'm, I'm very excited about this. It's pretty amazing that you have this running on uh, hardware. Is this a... Like a don't ask, uh, it's not out yet sort of situation. We think we can yeah, ever I see think, this in the wild. I, I think it's fair to say that it's don't ask, uh, it's not out yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about producing it and we're planning on it mm -hmm. probably at some point. It's not a huge high priority because it is right. super niche. Yeah. Um, there is one bug that is kind of like hounding me mm -hmm. that I've got to work out before I feel like it's super ready. What will happen is that... Um, the Game Boy will basically crash. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's no fun. No. So well, I, the good thing is that people have waited since 1981 for this, so yeah, the, it's not a huge... Another, we got another 30 years. It's just <laughs> fine. Um, good. But yeah, I would like to, like, at some point when we're not under the crunch, take some time and, like, tweak it and, and get it where you could play it for 20 minutes or 30 minutes yeah. without crashing. Yeah. It would be awesome. Very fun. There's some weird bugs. Like, I had this one bug where the character in the Celeste game will, like get the wrong palette and turn like the color of the background instead oh, of like the color they're <laughs> supposed to be. So yeah, it's, um, it's tricky. So you know what, I'm gonna hide that view just so we don't block you with the keyboard. And then I just wanted to see if uh, you maybe could field some questions from me and maybe oh, yeah. Todd over there. Bring it. 
Bring it. Uh, I'm happy Discord. to answer questions. They may not be the answers you want. <laughs> I can't promise that. So first, first thing is you've been doing a lot of CircuitPython Bluetooth. That's been a big focus. Yes, lately. yes. Um, Bluetooth's awesome. It is awesome, and I'm also. I was saying earlier, I'm impressed at how robust it's become uh, over the years because yeah. it used to be very it's flaky. Not, that's not due to me. It kind. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> just in general. But I, I am. I'm happy that we're doing stuff, and I'm happy I got a chance to revisit because I've kind of written it off as a way to right. communicate between little devices because I was. Was always dropping my connection and the range was terrible. But it seems yep. like it actually yep. is really solid for certain applications. Um, mm -hmm. Because it works really well in these smallish ranges, the thing I think that I and a lot of other people are often curious about doing from CircuitPython and Bluetooth are things like HID keyboard mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mouse with mm -hmm. an accelerometer or something like that, right, or right. MIDI, for example, Bluetooth MIDI is a thing. Yep. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of that stuff coming to CircuitPython? So Dan had actually already gotten uh, HID working. So HID stands for Human Interface Device. So it's, it's anything that acts like a keyboard or mouse or gamepad or anything like that. Um, Dan actually had it working, and then I was like, you know, I really would like it if it worked this slightly other way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the last couple of weeks, I, w we've really redone the BLE library to what I think is, is going to be a better foundation in the long term, but I broke HID. Whoops. So um, when I'm back at home next week or uh, the week after, we'll definitely revisit it and, and get it working mm -hmm. again. Um, Here's H a random question that just inspired, which is, is, <laughs> yeah. is, is it secure enough that you'd use it to send like a password from a Circuit Playground Express that's a little... <laughs> Password uh, keeper. That's kind a of thing. that's a great question, and the answer is I really don't know. Uh -huh. um, Bealy has Bluetooth in general has had a problem with um, being insecure. Uh -huh. You'll see that there's like like man in the middle attack uh -huh. sorts of things, um, but I think in general the answer is yes because mm -hmm. like you can buy a Bluetooth keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, sure, that yeah. would be okay. Right, of course. Um, and if you're, I wouldn't use it in an environment where you're really, yeah, where it's <laughs> like have private information. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that like they use wires for that stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Uh, so I would say, yeah, probably, but mm -hmm. not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, the newer security stuff is also harder to implement. So um, if if you're critical and you care about this stuff, do your homework and make sure that we're doing what you expect. Right. Uh, because it is easier for us on our side to implement the, the less secure stuff first. So speaking of the less secure stuff, uh, aren't some of the multi-device media remotes from like Logitech, aren't some of those Bluetooth nowadays? I wonder if we can do those kinds of things you used to do with infrared. Probably. Yeah. I, I haven't taken a look. I mean. 2.4 gigahertz radio, like very basic radio, is actually pretty common as well. Mm -hmm. And that's not secure as far as I know at mm -hmm. all. I mean, it might be a, a custom protocol, mm -hmm. uh, but custom protocols are notoriously insecure mm -hmm. because they only have so many people looking at mm -hmm. them. Um, yeah, because I think it would be interesting to do like a hit just this one button or this cap sense mm -hmm. on our device, a feather or, or some right. playground, and turn on my TV, my receiver, yep. my you know, sound bar, et cetera. Right. I mean, that's an, that's a super easy project, especially if you pair like the, the circuit player in blue fruit with an IR transmitter, which mm -hmm. I don't think we actually support yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but having the idea that you use Bluetooth between two of the Adafruit devices and then just do and then blast IR, blast stuff IR that needs that. Locally. I think there's a mix. I think there's some, some of these remotes yeah. are Bluetooth. One thing I'm excited about is I wanted to actually have a bunch of temper temperature sensors around my house. And I don't care if people sniff that data. Like that's mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to me. So mm -hmm. I, I kinda wanna just make a Bluetooth device that just broadcasts the temperature. Mm -hmm. And then I can have one anywhere in my house that just listens for all those different broadcasts uh -huh. and could log it. I'm gonna grab this so I can just look at the chat and see if there's any questions. Uh, but I also wanted you to talk about proximity stuff because I know you've done some demos yeah. and had some thoughts about uh, messing with your neighbors. Yeah, um, I should answer your MIDI question though first. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you asked about MIDI too. Um, I've taken a look at BLE MIDI. Uh, Apple devised the spec and then basically the MIDI folks were like, yep, that looks good. Um, it does one weird thing where it keeps track of the time codes as you send messages across it. Mm -hmm. And they do it in a really weird way where every Bealy packet, they put a header. And right now, we don't have the mechanics to know exactly when we send oh. a packet. Uh -huh. So there's there's some work to be there done there, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Exactly um, 
we we'll do it eventually. It's just like HID is definitely gonna happen before MIDI does, mm -hmm. for sure. So, yeah. Uh, oh, here's a question. What about being the host of a BT keyboard and connect to the REPL, David Glaudy? Yeah. Glaudy. Yeah. So um, those are that's kind of two separate questions. Uh, one of the changes I did in the BLE library that broke it was I wanted to make it easier to define Beely, they call them services, in a way that you can use both uh, where you're providing it but you're, or you're using it. Consuming it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, want, I wanted it to be one way to define what a service is and be able to use it on bo from both sides. So I, I really hope that once I take a look at the HID stuff, it will actually be bi-directional. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to, like, I, I found a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse um, the one thing I would say is that you have to be very careful. There's a lot of Bluetooth keyboards that are like legacy Bluetooth 3, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not what we're supporting here. We're supporting... This is 4.0? Is that where we're at? 4.0, 4.1. Mm -hmm. It can. Be, if you're looking to buy a keyboard that matches it, you should look for the term Bluetooth Smart mm -hmm. is one of the ways that they advertise it. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to just know a model number, I did a lot of research actually <laughs> on it. Um, there's a few Logitechs, but there's also Logitechs that don't that don't have that. Okay, maybe we'll get you post that um, in the live broadcast chat. Yeah, I'll have to take a look. Later. Uh, ping me on Discord if you want to mm -hmm. know, and then I'll see it later and I'll, I'll take a look. I'll look it up. Okay. Um, so that is the one thing that's really weird. Even like the Apple keyboard and mouse, they're like legacy, huh. like older Bluetooth. Yep. They won't work right uh, that way either. So yeah, I do want to be able to do that. Um, have it uh, circuit by them be a client, uh, mm -hmm. which would be the equivalent of like USB host where you plug a USB keyboard into a circuit Python device. Uh -huh. That's a whole separate thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first part of the question. The second yeah. part is actually um, having more sources for getting data into the serial engine, so to speak, of circuit Python. Right now, the only way we have it is if you're doing it from your computer. Yeah. Um, and I think we will at some point want to be able to have other sources for that data, but we don't really have a good way of managing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and you'd never be able to save because we're not doing that kind of file system stuff sort of locally. You'd be just typing directly into a REPL. Right. But I, I also do want to make it so that you can edit the files oh. over Bluetooth. Okay. So that's something I've started experimenting yeah. with because I, I see so many people, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but they, they only have phones or tablets, and I want to yeah. make it so that they can have the same circuit Python experience yeah. that you do over USB yeah. with a, a laptop. Uh, here's a question changing gears from Mr. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about circuit Python on a SNES cart, uh, which is the Super Nintendo Entertainment System? Right. Uh, would the additional resources available on a 16-bit system be useful for projects, music, games, etc., compared to the Game Boy? Yeah, so I, like, I would, the whole era is really interesting to me because, uh, that era of computing is very <laughs> insecure, which is convenient, mm -hmm. and it's also very simple. So there's no operating system that you're contending with or having to mm -hmm. uh, make happy. It's mm -hmm. It really is kind of like the lowest level, what we call bare metal programming, mm -hmm. where like once you have access, you're, you're kind of just hitting registers and you're making it do what you want. Mm -hmm. So I would like to expand to more carts at some point. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of hot, this kind of lives in my hobby time. Yeah. Um, I don't have a whole lot of that, and uh, it's actually like it takes a lot of time to make sure that the cart works mm -hmm. uh, well. Like uh, it's a one megahertz memory bus, so you have to respond really quickly, and that can be hard. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that there are, there is very rudimentary copy protection. Mm -hmm. So like for the Game Boy, it validates that the cart says Nintendo in the uh -huh. in, in the cart's memory. Uh -huh. Um, but we're able to play this trick where it reads it multiple times to do the well. It reads it once to do the validation, and then it reads it again to show it on the screen. Uh, and that's how we are get you interrupt, intercepting it and yep. then playing it back. Yeah. So like when it when it starts up <laughs> when it starts up, I just have a big long list of instructions that says like, okay, the tenth thing you respond to is the start of the Nintendo logo, and the fortieth thing that you respond with is the Adafruit <laughs> logo, because it, like it's that code is never changing. Uh -huh. That code is fixed. Yeah. Um, oh, so, so that allows you to figure that out. So there's stuff like that with the Super Nintendo, um, 
and just figuring out all the signals and stuff like the the nes i think is really weird where it has like two memory buses and stuff so i would like to do it but i would also like to finish this and make it available first so i'm kind of like yes limiting my hobby That's projects good. until i finally like finish get this to the point where i think it's finished and and actually we could sell it because yeah. It's a lot of the same parts you would get on a normal Adafruit board, yep. um, and, but it's a lot less expensive than comparable Very cool. um, things that you can find for the Game Boy. Uh, what are you excited about beyond this stuff? What's coming up? What are you passionate about that, that uh, is going to be happening in 2020, let's say? 2020, yes. I know it's um, not the end of the year yet, but it's good to start. No, I, I mean, and I, I should say, like, if you're new to the Circuit Python community, the last few years we've done this call for what do you think the next year is? Mm -hmm. um, and I love to do that. I, <laughs> oh, the first time I did it, I did the post, I think, where we announced that we were going to call it Circuit Python. But I did that in January, and I managed to be the most viewed blog post on the Adafruit <laughs> blog that year. <laughs> uh, hungry for this. I've, I've always been in, like, the top 10, because, but one of the reasons that is is because I always do it in January. I have the whole year to collect views. <laughs> um, so I do like to do a post on the blog. This is your other hobby. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're a content company, so, so it's good to do that. So okay. I expect, I think I'll have to look back when we have the call for, like, what do you want to see in the larger scope of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually giving a talk at uh, Pi Cascades in February next year, where I think Python's going kind of even broader in the next decade. Um, and I'll basically spoil it. Uh, I think it's all about what we talked about. There's computers for young folks in particular um, are tablets and phones. They're not laptops, they're not desktops. Like when I see my niece who's 10, like it's her iPad yeah. that she has that is her computer in the way that when I was like the first Dell desktop I mm -hmm. got, like it right. was mine, right? So I think kids these days, um, and this is not, I, I should not just say kids because generally phones and tablets are more accessible mm -hmm. in uh, developing countries mm -hmm. as well. So it's really important to me that we focus on providing CircuitPython to those folks. Mm -hmm. And this is why I've spent some time on the Beely file stuff and being able to edit from your phone and tablet is because there's a whole audience of folks that don't have access to computing and not even just computers in general, but actually programming them themselves right. that we're missing out on. And that like Adafruit's strength is that we're our audience is beginners. Mm -hmm. and there's always more beginners than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, well, and I think the exciting thing yeah. about that is that these are consumption devices the way they're currently, right? the software that's available for them and yeah. the ways that you can and can't interact with them. I think they've started to make some changes where there's actually kind of sort of a file system available, right, but right. it does seem like getting people the ability to actually create something in code yeah. for a piece of hardware via yeah. this is uh, is vital because yeah. people aren't going to have a desktop computer right. so as much. Uh, yeah, and we're not the only ones thinking that. There's yeah. there's some really interesting work. Like Apple's done interesting work with the uh, playgrounds. Swift, Swift playgrounds. Swift playgrounds, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Like They've done some interesting work there. Um, Google has uh, Grasshopper, I believe is what it's called. That's mm -hmm. their like, kind of like teach you to code on mm -hmm. a phone sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think any of those are really done that well, mm -hmm. but that's not their fault. I think it's so new that nobody's really figured out mm -hmm. what it means. And I think we'll kind of intercept it. Like, I'll do a terrible job too. <laughs> <laughs> but like the kids, my niece, like they'll be, have raised with this, like, how do I touch a yeah, screen and right. what do I do? Like, like I'll get it so far. And then folks who were actually raised in this environment of yeah. tablets yeah. will n understand how to make it better. Yeah. And actually, this is a note um, to myself for later that I always have been meaning to check out Make Code on yeah. the iPad. Can I create stuff in it? I don't think I can upload to a device from it. Maybe I can with an Android thing, but it's it's you know uh, it's another right. interface for creation of stuff that may work well for yeah. for this device. And I, I imagine they're you looking at Bluetooth as a way to do that as well. Right. Yeah. And I'm, in um, fact, at one point, I had done that with Make Code and a micro bit which could right, right. receive a yep. upload, I think, over Bluetooth. Yeah, from yeah I believe it. It's yeah. just, um, it's so early. Yeah. And like, but that's not a reason not to do it. Yeah. yeah we so, that. so that is the highest order thing that, that is important to me. 
Um, there's some other interesting microcontroller stuff happening, but mm-hmm. uh, USB high speed could be really cool. Um, basically, more bandwidth over the USB bus means mm-hmm. we can do things like audio and video. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at some point, we'll revisit that. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to do a like low cost logic analyzer mm-hmm. because uh, anytime you have a way of seeing something, yeah. right, introspecting something that's happening, that's mm-hmm. that makes it easier to understand. Yeah. Um, so having a low cost logic an- analyzer can make sense of what I squared C is mm-hmm. on the wire, mm-hmm. for example. I actually find um, that with the uh, modular synthesizers that I build and use is that I've now built a module that is a two-channel oscilloscope because it's so helpful to look right? at. What is this waveform that I think yep. I'm making to <laughs> modulate something else look like? I right. It's a visual right. representation, right. which is helpful. Yeah, so I think there's some cool stuff there, too. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say? I think we're, we're going to get close to wrapping up. I know this is longer than the, the typical workshop, but it's twice as many yeah. humans. <laughs> it averages out. Or three times as many, because Todd's <laughs> over there lending his psychic energy yeah. to us. You can feel it, right? I feel it. No, uh, I mean, thank you for having me. Yeah. It's fun to hang it's out. Like here. We're yeah. both remote, and yeah. I think this is only the second time we've met in yeah, person. Yeah, we met so. in New York uh, uh, a few years ago. Yeah, so. right, like soon after we started. Yeah. So, uh, thanks world. for having me, and uh, thank you to all the Adafruit community and CircuitPython communities for all that you've done. Like I, I dusted off my MIDI game Game Boy player, and like the library had just gotten that much better that I had to like keep up with it. Yeah. And so, uh, thank you to everybody who contributes and helps out on the forums and the mods on the Discord. Um, it's been great to see Discord in particular. Like I, I started it because of like some like somebody asked me to <laughs> I was like I gotta do this but like that first like few months was a lot of time on there making sure that like we had established uh, moderation policies and things like that but we've added all of these awesome mods like Mr. Certainly is one of them um, and they really have been super helpful yeah. I can step away I can go yeah. on vacation I don't have to worry about it and yeah. that's so total credit total credit to our community yeah, yeah. fantastic uh, good why don't you play us a happy sound and then I'll uh, <laughs> uh, finish up some uh, little details here yeah, give us some some bleeps and I don't remember. There we are. This is like the length. Oh, I made it. Well, the last thing I want to say uh, before we go is don't forget, schwa fort. Schwa hyphen <laughs> fort is going to get you 10% off in the Adafruit store today. So uh, if you want to get some cool stuff, go do it. That's a way to save money while you do it. Uh, thank you again, uh, everyone, for stopping by for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park, and this has been John Park's Workshop. Bye-bye. Bye. Say bye to Todd, too. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.